genetics. Patterns of inheritance, OK? I think this is where we ended last time. We had talked about PKU. Yep. Talked about PKU quite a lot. And think about PKU. You've either got it or you don't, right? You either have, you're either a phenylketonuronic or you're not, OK? So we're going to talk about some other human traits that are determined by a single gene. Because PKU is determined by a single gene. And that gene has two forms. So there are about 3,000 human traits that are determined by a single gene. And each of those genes has two forms. Cystic fibrosis is an example of one of those. Now, cystic fibrosis is a disease, genetically inherited disease. To have cystic fibrosis, you need to have two defective copies of the gene. All right, You need to have two defective copies of the gene. Remember, for every gene, you have two alleles. Right? For every gene, you have two alleles. So you've got to have the two defective alleles to have the symptoms of cystic fibrosis. Alleles. Alleles are the forms of the genes. I'm going to throw out gene and allele and some other terms without defining them yet, but I will define them a bit later. Okay? So cystic fibrosis then. There's one gene, two alleles. It's a bit more complicated than that because there's more than one gene. But anyway, um, the gene at some point in human history became mutated and resulted in the gene being defective. And if you get two copies of those defective alleles, you end up with cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a disease where you have sort of an overproduction of mucus, especially in the lungs. It's sort of a, a, a mucus disease. It's, it's, it's an interesting disease, and people don't usually survive beyond their mid-20s. Okay. One, um, I don't know, outward sign of the disease is that the fingernails, the nail bed, tends to be a little distorted. Rather than it being flat, fingers are a little bit clubbed and you've got this sort of distorted nail bed. Now, don't look at your nail beds. <gasps> Mine's a little bit up. Oh, my God, I'm on cystic fibrosis. If you had cystic fibrosis, you'd know about it. Okay? Isn't but, it true that, that babies with cystic fibrosis, if you lick them, they taste like maple syrup? No, I, I think that's another disease. I think that's another one. I think that's another one. There's one disease that if you I know, and I think it's called I think it's called maple syrup disease. <laughs> All right, but the sweat of someone who has cystic fibrosis does taste and smell a little different to to someone who doesn't. Okay. All right, um, but if the if the gene is defective, what does that say about the protein? Maybe the protein is defective. And in this case, the protein that's defective is this protein here. A weird shape, look at that. It's a protein that's found in your cell membrane, since it's an integral membrane protein, and it's responsible for the transport of chloride ions. And as a result of the gene being slightly defective, the protein doesn't work properly, so it doesn't transport chlorine, chloride ions properly. And as a result, there are all these issues on, on mucous membranes. Okay? The lining of the gut, lungs, those kind of, those kind of membranes. Okay? All right. So it's nice, isn't it nice that we can sort of tie that back to membranes, to membrane proteins, membrane transport? Yeah, or you just say, no, I want to forget that. Correct. Cystic fibrosis, you should have two defective copies of the alleles. Those alleles, right, a gene, those, it's a gene, stretch of DNA that codes for a protein. The protein that it codes for doesn't work properly. And as a result, it doesn't transport chloride ions properly. And as a result, you get the symptoms of cystic fibrosis. Okay? They're actually trying some gene therapy with cystic fibrosis. I don't know how um, successful it's been. But what they're trying to do, I think it's a mist or something that you would inhale, would go into your lungs. And that mist contains um, 
a good, normal copy of that gene. So they're hoping that that will then, if it can find its way into the nucleus of your cells, just a piece of DNA, it might be expressed, and so you might get the normal protein produced. OK, let's have a look at another trait then, which is one gene with two alleles in humans. What about this one? Polydactyly. Poly, many, dactyly, sort of your digits, fingers. This is where you have an extra finger. All right? There you go. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, six. Yes. Oh, come on. And is there no thumb? That's harsh. Yes. Um, in this case, I don't know. It doesn't look like it, does there? This is what? No, 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 no. This is a complete separate trait, right? which is determined by one gene that has two alleles. All right, polydactyly. And honestly, I forget whether, it's, whether you need two defective copies of the gene or whether um, you can have one normal or two normal copies of the genes that gives rise to polydactyly. I can't remember which one it is. I forgot to look that up before I came. But, okay. No. I won't spell allele. Spell it how you think you spell it, but I promise I will spell it and define it in a minute. All right, a bit later. All right, so polydactyly. You either have an extra finger or you don't, right? There's one gene with two alleles that determines that. Boldness. Now, not all boldness. Male pattern baldness is determined by a gene with two alleles. Now, what's interesting about this is men get it, women don't, right? But, yeah, it's much more common in men, right? I'm not going to talk very much about sex-linked characteristics, but this is one which is sex-linked, linked to your sex. Okay, yeah, I've got a nice picture of that to show you. All right. So, guys, if you've got the genes, start investing in Rogaine. That's all I can say. <laughs> all right, so baldness. You either do start to lose your hair or you don't. There's one gene with two alleles. <coughs> Haemophilia is another one. Haemophilia is a trait determined by one gene with two alleles, and it affects your blood clotting. If you're a haemophiliac, your blood doesn't clot properly. So again, you can tie that back to a defective protein, a defective clotting protein. <coughs> and obviously, here's a wound which is just not clotting, so it continues to bleed. Now, it will clot after a while, but it's very, very slow. And this is what the factor, the protein, looks like responsible for doing clotting. But in the hemophiliac, it's defective because the gene that codes for it doesn't make a correct protein. All right. Hemophilia is a disease associated with blood clotting. If you're normal, your blood clots normally. If you're a hemophiliac, you lack certain clotting factors, certain proteins involved with the clotting process. So your blood doesn't clot if you have a wound. Just continue to bleed. Is that a British spelling? It's the proper spelling. That's all I do know. What you mean is the AE versus an E? Um, I'm, I don't know. Is that an American spelling? Does anyone know for I sure? The it's H-E-M-O. Okay. All right. So maybe the, the European spelling or the English spelling adds the A. Okay. So they would never clot? Or they just clot? No, it does clot after a while. All right. It does clot after a while. It takes a long time to clot, though. You've got to be very careful when you get injuries, especially internal bruising. So the protein involved in the clotting process doesn't work properly because the gene is defective. Okay. And if you get two copies of that defective gene, you don't make the correct protein, so your blood doesn't clot properly. Now, if you have one copy of the defective gene and one copy of the good gene, well, that good gene is going to code for a functional, normal functioning protein, right? So does that mean only half of your? No, if you have one copy of the bad gene, one copy of the good gene, you clot just fine. You're not hemophiliac, OK? All right. 
And then color blindness, which again mostly affects men. So this, I'm going to turn the lights off and let you have a look at this. Um, but it, depending on how the colors are rendered by the projector, sometimes it doesn't. Have a look at this. What, what number can you see in it? OK, now, now you said it, I can see it. But I can't really see it otherwise. Yeah. This is one of them. Don't, again, there are books with many of these in. And the way the colors are rendered by the projector probably nullifies this test. But color blindness, and more men are color blind than women because it's sex linked, um, is genetic. One gene with two alleles. You either are color blind or you're not. Now, there are different forms of color blindness, though. All right. So women can be color blind, but it's less common. Now, when I, I didn't know I was color blind until I got to college in England. And um, I, there was a program. I don't know if there's a similar one over here, but you could, the Air Force would teach you to fly jets for free. Yeah, I thought, oh, that's a screaming deal. I'd love to fly jets for free. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, they put you through physicals and medicals and so on and so forth. And they failed because the colorblind test. And they said, sorry, you know, you're red, green, colorblind, and the landing lights are red and green. That's a problem. <laughs> and so, um, obviously, I looked it up, researched it, and then I went back and told my mum, and she felt really bad because I said, I inherited that gene from you, mum. And she felt really bad. <laughs> Um, well, like red, green, color blind. I still see red and green, as I think I do. But if there was like a book on a shelf, I tell you what, it's kind of weird. A book on a shelf which might have a green cover and then red writing on it, like the spine of the book. If you look at that, the red sort of flashes a little bit. It's weird. So if we turned our lights sideways, you wouldn't know if it was red or green. No, I can still tell the difference between a red and green light. Don't know. Don't know. It might be. It may well be. Yeah. So what if your if your parents or your parents are colorblind but you're not? Mm. That's a good question, Seth. Or what about if one of your parents has a hemophiliac and you're not? Or what about if one of your parents has cystic fibrosis and you're not? Or what about if neither of your parents has cystic fibrosis but you have it? So we're gonna look at these patterns of inheritance. And how can we pre predict what you might inherit based on what your parents are? If your parents have stinky urine after eating asparagus and you don't, how can we explain that? Okay, so we're going to look at these patterns of inheritance. And there are many patterns of inheritance that are very predictable. And that's what we're going to explore, okay, in this section on genetics. And obviously, it's very relevant to the lab write up you're doing on the Nebraska plants. Okay, yep. For all of these up here, yep. it's, you have to have two defective genes or alleles to have it? Um, for this you do. This one I can't remember. This one I can't remember. Um, I believe this one you do and this one. Well, no, hang on. So we just ignore that on the test. No it way. gets complicated <laughs> when it's sex linked. gets complicated when it's sex linked. Because so you only need, well, yeah, so it gets complicated when it's sex linked. These are traits, right? These are traits that are determined by a single gene that has two alleles, OK? Hang on. All right. Let's take, so the question was, I think some of you are like, would well, you get these weird things? And I don't mean to say weird, but do you get these diseases or these, these characteristics when you have defective copies of the gene? Cystic fibrosis definitely do. You know what a chondroplasia is? Chondroplasia is a genetic form of dwarfism. Okay? You're a genetic dwarf if you have a chondroplasia. It's a single gene with two alleles. If you have the recessive alleles, I'm not going to call them defective, but the recessive ones, which we often associate with being defective, you are normal for height. All of you have two recessive copies of the achondroplasia gene. If you're an achondroplasia, if you have a chondroplasia, you're a genetic dwarf, you either have one normal and one dominant gene or two dominant genes. OK? 
Okay. So, all right, I'm glad you're thinking. That's what I wanted to do. And so now we're going to sort of move on and explain some of these things that you're thinking about. Okay. Okay. Check out that one. Hairy ears. Yeah, totally hairy. Now, men get it, women don't. Thank goodness. Could you imagine? <laughs> could you imagine shaving your ears? You got your armpits and your legs, and now your ears. Oh goodness. Um, men get it, but look at the ethnicity of these men. So do you remember the PKU gene was Turkey, the country where it's most abundant in the population. Somewhere like Finland, where it's perhaps least abundant. But this gene tends to be most abundant in, I think it was India and certain parts of um, the Muslim world, the gene is more abundant. But only men get it because it's sex linked. But you see, we're developing patterns, right? We can say, ah, oh, well, only men get this one. Women don't, or at least less common in women. So now we're going to start to explain these patterns of inheritance, OK? Like Sorry? Like no, it's different. It's, um, yeah, I don't know about women with facial hair. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Let's move on. OK, so is it chapter 14, Mendelian genetics? So we're going to look at Mendelian genetics, OK? Got another story to tell you, though. You ready for this one? All right, so Mendelian genetics, then, it's the study of inheritance. It's how biologically express, expressed traits are inherited. But it's only one pattern or mechanism of inheritance. Right, Mendelian genetics explains one kind of inheritance. Or one pattern of inheritance, I should say. Pattern of inheritance. You can look at the way traits are inherited based on how they're inherited they'll follow certain rules, some of them, predictable rules. Mendelian traits, they follow certain predictable rules of inheritance, OK? Which is nice. Those of you going into the medical field, has anybody thought about going into genetic counselling? No? It's a fascinating field. Genetic counselling, it's a master's degree. There's only a few schools that offer it. It's quite expensive to go through their programmes. But if you're motivated by money, it's extremely well paid. Um, and you've got to be very smart to do it, OK? And um, what you would do as a genetics counsellor is you might have families come in, and um, maybe they're pregnant or they want to get pregnant, but they may have a genetic history of a certain disease in their family, and they're concerned about whether their child might have it. And so then you can talk to them about, well, this is what it is, this is how it's inherited, these are maybe the chances that your child might have it. And then there are tests that you can do right, on your genotype, on the um, other parent's genotype, and then maybe on the unborn child via an amniocentesis. And then you can either make predictions or get data that will confirm whether they might have this genetic disorder or not. Okay? So it's very interesting. It's an interesting field. Loads and loads of genetic, um, genetic disorders or genetic issues. All right, so what have we got here then? White tiger. That's, al diff that's different to an albino tiger. OK? And then we've got your normal orange coat tiger. OK? So we've got white tiger, orange coat tiger. And I'll tell you the story. Anybody been to India? No, that is so high on my like, must go to list, but I've not been there yet. So <clears throat> tigers right, are still present in India, amazingly, given that there's now a billion people in India. All right, cheetahs, last cheetah went extinct in India was about 1960s, 1959, unfortunately. I hope I'm dead when they announce the date when there are no more tigers in India, because that would be a really sad day. But so tigers in India used to be a lot more abundant, a lot more prevalent than they are today. And India was, had provinces, and they were sort of governed by maharajas. Okay? 
And the Maharajas that govern their provinces, they used to like to go out and hunt tigers on elephant back. Okay? And there was a province called Rewa. Right? And the Maharaja went out one day on a tiger hunt. And he would be on top of his elephant with his gun. And he might have a couple of other folks on elephants with their guns. And he would have beaters. And he'd have a long line of beaters in the bushes. Right? And they would go way far away from him, form a big sort of like semicircle around him, but a great distance. And they would beat pots and pans or sticks together or brush. And they would walk through. And they would sort of flush out the tigers towards where the Maharaja was on his elephant. And the Maharaja would shoot them. That was the, the sport they had. But one day, the Maharaja of Rewa saw a white tiger. White tiger. Looks like an orange tiger, except where the orange coat color is, it's white. And he thought that was such an amazing creature that he decided not to shoot it. He caught it, and he brought it into captivity. And he said, this is an amazing creature. I've never seen this before. I'm going to bring it into captivity, and I want to see if I can breed more white tigers. Now, had he taken 181, he might have understood patterns of inheritance and, and been a little more successful. Though serendipitously, he was quite successful. So, got the white tiger. I think the white tiger he called Began. And he paired her up with a male orange tiger called Mohan. Right? Because he only had orange tigers, one white, one orange. He thought, well, you know, if I cross my white tiger with my orange tiger, maybe I'll get some white tigers. How cool would that be? Right? So he put them together, and I don't know if they fell in love, but, um, you know, the animal instincts took over, right? And they had babies. And what do you think the babies looked like? What? You think they were orange? I don't know. How many, how many in a litter of tiger cubs? Let's just say it's somewhere between two and six, all right? And what do you, what do you think the babies look like? One out of four. Hang on, hang on. Give me one possibility at a time. Sorry? All orange. All orange. So what, 100% orange? Yep. OK, what's another possibility? Come on, let's get some possibilities. Sorry? Ah, what, it's kind of like the white and the yellow sort of blended, yeah, like mixing the paint? Creamsicle. All right. <laughs> So what, 100% of them was sort of this whitish orangish color. Yeah, all right. 50-50. What's another possibility? 50% white and 50%. What's another possibility? What's some other possibilities? Sorry? Yeah, right, it's another one. 500% white. What else you got? Right, I won't write any more down, but OK. 75% could be orange, 25% white. Oh, come on, Angelica, give me one more. Cameron, you're never short on ideas. You just want to see what it looks like. I know you do. So I'm going to capitalize upon that, sort of like that. I want to see, so keep going. 60% orange, 40%, 10%, 90%. What about a couple of white bands, a couple of orange bands? Is that a possibility? It's a possibility, right? You may not think it's likely, but a possibility. All right. So. We've just come up with what? Some hypotheses, yeah? Right? And if we understood patterns of inheritance, and if we knew what kind of traits these were in the tigers, we could probably predict with a fair degree of certainty what they could be, right? But we don't right now. So what we can say is maybe, all right, I understand patterns of inheritance, and under this scenario, I would expect that. And so if this is true, my scenario or pattern of inheritance must be correct. right? If my data agrees with that hypothesis, the rationale behind that hypothesis must be correct. Right? Yeah? 
Yes. Um, <coughs> could this have something to do? Okay, the white tiger is female. What if it was reversed around? Would that play a part? Uh, it could. In this case, not. Okay. Okay. Could in this case. Yeah. But what if the white tiger was a Siberian tiger where those are dominant? Ah, but they were both. They were both from um, India. Okay. White tiger's not sterile. It's not albino. You might say albino. Albino creatures are sterile, yes? I don't know, are they? I think there's less sperm motility. But. You want to know what they look like? Yes. Sure? Yes. Oh, it broke. No, it didn't. Right. So they did have babies. And they were all orange. All orange. Okay? So, what, which hypothesis is that data confirmed? First one. All right. No, it's not. I doubt there are any pictures of his tigers. There might be, but where they are, who knows? All right, so the plot thickens. All right, here we've got the babies, the offspring, and the Maharaj is very disappointed. He thought maybe the white tiger was just a fluke, a one off, never to be seen again. Okay, so he kind of gave up. All right, so all right, well, the way it goes. But he still liked his white tiger. But, and I don't want you to assign any human morals to this. All right. It just so happens that one of the offspring got together with one of the parents. Okay, someone I guess left a cage door open. Anyway, so there was a mating between one of the offspring and the mum. What do you think the offspring looked like? Come up with some ideas. <laughs> You're in it. No, no other ones? Well, based on your first, <laughs> based on what you said initially, don't you think you would go with 100% orange? Because we've still got an orange tiger mating with a white parent. But it has, but it has, a white but it has the genes from the white parent. It has a white too. gene. Yeah. Hmm. It's got 50%. So what's it going to look like? Better result of white babies. Yeah. What, think it's 100% whitish orange? 50-50. No. 50-50? 75-25. Anybody want to put money on it? Anyone want to put money on it? No? Ah, now I see how confident you are. All right. OK, you ready? Half of them were orange, half of them were white. So, how can we explain this and other similar patterns of inheritance? How can we explain it? What's going on biologically that causes these patterns of inheritance? Yep. Okay, all right, good. So those of you that you know already have an understanding of Mendelian genetics or have read ahead on the book and, and get a good idea, you've probably got a pretty good idea of what's going on, right? So all right, let's let's explain. Let's go into a bit more detail about this. Okay, so how can we explain patterns of inheritance? How can we explain it? What are the different patterns of inheritance? They don't all follow this pattern of inheritance, but the one we're going to focus on. Our Mendelian gen is Mendelian inheritance. And who's this, who's this guy here? Mendel, right? How many of you have had some Mendelian genetics before? Some of you, probably. All right, so Gregor Mendel then was one of the first to investigate these laws of inheritance. At least one of the first to investigate it very in a formal, structured, scientific approach. He was a monk, and I guess he had a lot of time on his hands and like to work with plants and count peas and that kind of stuff. And he did most of his work between 1856 and 63. And he published them in 1865. 
And when he published them, they didn't make a big impact in the scientific world. Certainly not the impact they should have had. And he worked with garden peas. That was his study organism. In our lab that we've done in, in class, what's our study organism? Brassica. brassica plants, right? So he worked with pea plants. Now, let me tell you, if he'd have had brassica plants, he'd have worked with brassica plants. It would have taken him a lot less time to do what he did. Because pea plants take a long time to go through their generations. You're lucky we've got the brassica plants go from seed to seed in just over a month. Yeah. So and go through many generations. All right. Oh, crikey, look at that E. I wonder how that happened. All right. So first, I need to define and explain phenotype. All right, phenotype. So think of the phenotype as any sort of measurable characteristic an organism has. Any measurable characteristic an organism has. It's typically equated with things that you can see, externally visible characteristics or traits. Like coat color in tigers, flower color in plants, eye color in people. But it's more than that. Blood type is not something you can see, right? Your blood type, but it's something that we can certainly measure and quantify. So that would be sort of a phenotype at the molecular level. So you can have molecular level phenotypes, not just things that you can see. OK? And then what about this one? IQ. I think would be considered a phenotype. So, phenotype. What contributes to an organism's phenotype? What contributes? What determines an organism's phenotype? OK, good. The genes that you have, OK? The genes. I'm going to write genotype because that refers to the particular genes that you've got. Okay, so the particular genes that you've got influence your phenotype. But what else? What else influences your phenotype? Environment. Yes, the environment does. Good. The environment you're in can influence your phenotype. OK? So I'll use skin color as, as a really nice one. OK? You might have the genes that says that you have, you know, very sort of light color, white skin, as we might call it. Or you might have the genes that say that you have very dark color or black skin. OK? But the environment you're in can also influence your skin color. Right? You might have white light skin. But if you go out in the sun, it's going to darken up. OK? So the phenotype of skin color has both a genetic and an environmental component. OK? So some phenotypes are determined 100% by genes. Some phenotypes are determined 100% by genes. Like whether your urine smells stinky, after eating asparagus, right? The genes you carry. Your blood type is influenced by the genes you carry. Whether you've got attached earlobes, influenced by the genes you carry. Whether you have PKU, influenced by the genes you carry. Okay? All right. There are other phenotypes that are determined. I'll say 100% by the environment, other phenotypes. Now, that's, I, I don't know, you can argue whether that's true or not. But there are some phenotypes that are determined by the environment. That's why I've got this picture up here. Anybody know what those, those flowers are? Anybody know? Yeah, they're hydrangeas. All right, hydrangeas. I don't think you're going to find them very common in Phoenix, the Phoenix area. You might, but. So they're hydrangeas. Now, See, we've got blue flowers and we've got pink flowers. These plants 
are genetically the same for flower color. They have the same genes for flower color, yet we have a blue and a pink one. And the environmental factor that determines the phenotype for flower color is soil pH. If you have an acidic soil, so if these plants grow in an acidic soil, the flowers are blue. If these plants glow, grow in an alkaline soil or a basic soil, the flower color is pink. Okay? Sorry? I guess, yeah, because flamingo feather color is determined by the food that they eat. Yeah. So, in this case, the phenotype is determined by the environment. Then you, yeah. Is there anything in humans that's like that? Um, that's uh, entirely determined by the environment. Um, fetal alcohol syndrome. Okay, I think that would be a good one. Okay, the phenotype of fetal, fetal alcohol syndrome. So if you've got some phenotypes that are 100% determined by the environment, uh, genotype, some that are determined by the environment, there are many phenotypes that are partly, and I'll say X percent, and I'll put Y percent, that are in part determined by genes and in part determined by the environment. So there's an environmental component as well as a genetic component. And this is what the psychologists tell me. Something like IQ. Okay? IQ is about 60% determined by your genotype and 40% by your environment. Okay? Skin color would be another good one, which part genotype, part environment. Height in humans has a genetic component and an environmental component. So there are many, many phenotypes that are part genes, part environment. What, how would that influence maybe your nutrition? Okay. Yeah, but that's a change in the genetics. But nutrition is one component. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, nutrition can, absolutely. I mean, you must have seen the, the graphs of, you know, when you're a baby and as you grow up, teenager, and as you get to be an adult, and then as you get older, your height goes down a little bit. All right, you do get a bit shorter. And it's partly because, you know, your bones, osteoporosis coming into that, so maybe the amount of calcium in your diet is something that... And I don't think it's just the hunched overness. It's, you do get a little bit shorter. Okay. All right, but height in humans is a trait that's determined by many, 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 many genes. It's not just one gene with two alleles that determines height in humans. There are many genes. It's known as a quantitative trait. And I'm going to add one little bit of complexity here that if you don't want to know it, just switch off your ears. But it's an interesting one. And that is your phenotype is determined by your genotype and the environment and one other component. The genes that you have can actually interact with your environment. So the genes that you have may not respond the same in all environments. It's called a G times Z interaction. So I'm never going to test you on it, those of you that are focused on what do we need to know for the test, right? <coughs> A quantitative trait is a trait, like height in humans, which is determined by multiple genes, many genes acting together, not just a single gene. So like, going back generations or something? No, like there is one gene with two alleles that influences um, whether your urine is stinky after eating asparagus. Okay? Height, you have many, many, many genes that influence your height. Okay? Yeah, and I'm probably not going to talk at all about quantitative traits. All right? 
Think about these Mendelian traits as either one or the other, right? You're one or the other. Quantitative traits, they have, you're not one height or the other, are you? Right? There are tall folks and short folks, and then people in the middle. So there's loads of different heights. Traits that have many, 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 many different values are often quantitative traits or have a very strong environmental component. Okay? All right. So you're good with phenotype, though, right? And what influences the phenotype? The genes and the environment together. Sometimes it's completely genes, sometimes it's environment, sometimes it's variable amounts of each. Okay? All right, so now let's look at what Mendel did. So we're going to have a look historically as experiments, what data he got and how he interpreted those data. Now those of you, especially those of you going into medicine, but honestly, any other field you're going into, you're going to be presented with data that you're going to need to evaluate and draw conclusions from. Okay? No matter what field you go into, the medical field loads. All right? You'll be presented with lab results and all sorts of information that you're going to need to interpret and draw some conclusions on. Okay? All right. The issue is, and what's remarkable about what Mendel did and all of science really, is when they collect their data, it's up to the scientist, the investigator, to draw the conclusions. Because if it's good, if it's, I guess, new science, if they're making new discoveries, there's no one they can ask about what these results mean. Right? Because no one's done it before. No one knows the answer to those questions. Before Mendel did his experiments, there was no one on the planet he could ask, well, what do my results mean? No one had done it. Okay? All right, so here's what Mendel did then. He worked with plants. And his initial experiments, he worked with flower color in pea plants. So he worked with plants that had flowers because they were easy to cross. They didn't argue about who they were going to mate with. Okay? People do, and depending on what kind of animal you're working with, sometimes there are issues. Plants, easy. Do it. You can mate whoever with whoever. Okay? So he was wise when he chose the experimental system. He used very distinct characteristics. For example, the flower color, he used flower color, and there were purple or white flowers. So that's quite distinct, not ambiguous. He did highly controlled experiments. So if he was crossing one plant with another, if he was crossing a plant with one phenotype with another, he made sure that those plants he was crossing differed only in the phenotype that he was investigating, that they were identical or the same in every other respect. Okay? That way he's only dealing with one factor. And he was very quantitative in how he collected his results. Good experimental design, used very large numbers in his experiments. So he did lots of crosses, large numbers. That's important. He recorded his data meticulously. And he analyzed his data with algebraic equations. So he's a good model for a scientist doing good, robust work and following the scientific method. It really is. Okay. So let's have a look at exactly what he did then. Here's what he observed. So, first he took true breeding plants. I'll give you a definition of true breeding later, but I'll just mention it now, okay? A plant that is true breeding for a particular phenotype means that if you take a true breeding plant for a phenotype, and I'll use flower color as my example. So if you take a true breeding plant for purple color flowers, and you cross it with another plant that is true breeding for purple color flowers, you will only ever get purple color flowers. You can breed them together 
for however many gener generations you want, and you will only ever get purple flowers. Okay? That's what true breeding means. It's purple flower is only possible, only one that's possible. If you're true breeding for white color flower, flowers, then you can only have white color flowers within that population. Okay? And again, I'll give you a definition later. So he took true breeding plants, all right? He took true breeding purple flowered plants and true breeding white flowered plants, and he crossed them. And he did it like this. So there's the purple color flower. And pea plants in their flowers make both male and female gametes. Okay? Make both pollen and ovules. Okay? And so if he wanted to cross, for example, a purple with a white color flower, well, he would take the white uh, purple flower, snip off the anthers, which produce the pollen, and then he would use a paintbrush and he would take pollen from the white flower and cross it onto the purple color flower. And you can do the reciprocal, you can do the opposite. Snip the anthers off the white ones and move pollen from the purple to the white. It doesn't matter which way around you do it. Okay? So he's just crossing true breeding purple with true breeding white. Okay? And that's how he did it. He was curious to see what the offspring would look like. And what he found was that all of the F1s, all of the offspring, had purple color flowers. These very large numbers, the white color seemed to disappear, go away. So that made him go, hmm, what's going on? Now, it's a shame the Maharaja of Rewa didn't go back and hit the journals right and read it, you know, Mendel's papers back in 1965. So Mendel wasn't content to leave it at the F1 generation. Okay? What he did then is he did an F1 by F1 cross. So he took the F1 plants and he self-fertilized them. So he crossed, in essence, an F1 with an F1. Okay? So he crossed the purple flower plants with the purple flower F1 plants. Now I'll give you a very subtle hint. Are you know, noticing the similarity of what he did and what we did in lab? So he did an F1, F1 cross, self-fertilized them, and he wanted to see what he would get in the F2s. And here's what he found. He found that he got purple and white color flowers. So the white trait mysteriously reappeared. But he wasn't content to just say, oh, there's some purple, there's some white, all right, I'm good to go home. He was quantitative in his approach, and he counted the number of purple and the number of white flowers. And when he did the counts, he found that the purple to white flower ratio was a three to one ratio. For every three purple flowered plants, there was one white flowered plant. All right? And this was repeatable. He could do it time and time and time again and get basically the same results. So now he had to explain this. What's the mechanism? What's the underlying mechanism? There's our F1 generation, crossed F1 with F1. There's our F2. These are some of his data. 705 plants had purple flowers. 224 had white flowers. That gives you, not exactly, but pretty close to a 3 to 1 ratio. All right, so here are some of the, sort of the conclusions he drew, and some of these are pretty self-evident. The white trait was masked by the purple trait in the F1s, right? One trait was masked by another. Didn't disappear, that white trait. It just seemed to be masked by the purple one. So one trait masked another, in the F1 under the conditions of his crosses. Now, he called the masked factor or the masked phenotype the recessive phenotype. He said if it's masked, it's the recessive one. And if it's expressed or not masked, if it's always expressed, he called that the dominant one.
And he always saw this 3 to 1 ratio in the F2 generation when he did a self-cross of the F1s and the F1s resulted from true breeding parents. Okay? You don't always see a 3 to 1 ratio in the F2s. It depends on what you did with your F1s and what you did with your parents. Okay? That's important. What did we see in the Tigers in the F2s? 50-50, a 1-to-1 ratio, not a 3-to-1. Okay? We can still explain it. All right, so I want you to make some predictions now. Let's just say I took an individual with cystic fibrosis and crossed them with another individual with cystic fibrosis. What would their children look like? How many of you think all of the offspring would have cystic fibrosis? How many of you think that there would be a 3 to 1 ratio? How many of you think it would be half and half? How many of you think that none of them would have cystic fibrosis? Okay. All right. The answer is, drum roll, you ready? What happens if they only had one baby? How can you get a 3 to 1 ratio if you've got only one baby? If they had three more. Here's the deal, all right? It, it comes down to chance and probabilities. So, in this instance, you would have a 100% chance of having a child, an individual, that had cystic fibrosis. 100% chance. Okay? You, well, if you've got 100% chance, then that's your result. Okay? I've not given you sort of the, 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 the analytical power to make these predictions yet, but I just want you to think about it before I do. No, not necessarily. I will explain it. I, I do. I will explain it, but I want you to think right now. I, I'm expecting some of you to be a little puzzled, and that's okay. So, 100% of the offspring are going to have cystic fibrosis. And don't put your morals into this. Let's just say that they had more than two kids. The F1 are the offspring. First filial. F means filial, which really means son. It's the first generation. Think of it as the, of the offspring. Okay? So if we had an F1 by F1 cross, two offspring cross, what would we get in the F2s? What would they have with respect to cystic fibrosis? They would all have cystic fibrosis. All right. Uh, eye color is kind of weird. It doesn't follow these patterns of Mendelian inheritance because there's more than one gene, more than one allele for eye color, and it's um, co-dominant. Yeah, we'll talk. Hang on, we'll talk about that later. No, you're going to get an F2, which will be the second filial generation. Okay? If we crossed an individual that had cystic fibrosis with another individual that had cystic fibrosis, we would get the F1s, 100% chance of having cystic fibrosis. If we crossed one of the F1s with the F1s, we would have 100% chance of the F2s having cystic fibrosis. Okay? Think of those grandchildren. Okay? So what about this? What about if we took an individual with cystic fibrosis and crossed them with a normal individual? When I say normal, I mean someone who doesn't have cystic fibrosis. What are the offspring going to look like? What are the F1s going to look like? Oh, you have to know what the normal parents are. All right. So what could they be? What could the F1s be? 
What could they be? All right. So one idea, one hypothesis, is that they're fifty percent CF and fifty percent normal. What's another hypothesis? Any other hypotheses? What we'll switch these? Okay. Working out the F1s, we F1 by F1 cross, is tough because we don't really know what the genes this individual carries. So let me show you how you can work these out. All right? I'm not going to do it right now, but in just a sec. I wanted to give you these scenarios because I wanted you to, to think. Okay? What could it be? Now, Mendel got his data. He understood how these patterns worked. He could have made these predictions. Okay? All right, so let's carry on a little bit of what Mendel did, and then I'll come back to that, how you can make those predictions. So Mendel didn't just look at flower color. You know, maybe that was one off. Maybe only flower color followed those patterns. He looked at some other traits. He looked at flower position, which he observed to be one or the other. Flowers either occurred on the end of the shoots, in which case they were terminal, or they were axial. So think of axial as being like the armpit. You've got a main shoot, you've got a side shoot. Where the side shoot and the main shoot meet, that's the axis. So sometimes the flowers are axial. But he found that if he followed the same procedure he did with his flower color crosses, that this trait also followed his rules. He got, in this case, a 3.14 to 1 ratio of axial flowers to terminal flowers. And then he looked at seed color, and he noticed that some seeds were yellow, some seeds were green. Well, he did his crosses, and he found that he did get, look at that, really close to a 3 to 1 ratio of yellow to green. And look at these numbers he was dealing with. He counted 6,022 yellow peas, 2,001 green peas. It's a lot of peas to count, right? And then he looked at flower, uh, pea sh seed shape, round versus wrinkled, Again, got pretty close to a 3 to 1. Pod shape, inflated versus constricted, close to a 3 to 1. Pod color, green and yellow. Stem length, tall and dwarf. And again, all of them, all of those characteristics he chose seem to follow his patterns of inheritance. All right. So I'm going to come back to Punnett squares. All right, but I'm going to introduce you to them right now so that we can work out this cystic fibrosis thing. Okay? But I'm going to whiz through it and I'm going to explain the rationale next as to why we do what we do with the Punnett squares. Okay? Does that make sense? What's the first word you're using? What squares? Punnett squares. Just be good with the term and I will come back to them. Okay? I just want to try and make you think a little bit, because Ashley's fallen asleep. Okay? <laughs> this Punnett square, again, you're not, you may not understand it fully this first time around, and that's okay. I don't intend for you to, because I'll come back to them. All right? But Punnett Square is just a tool that we can use. It's a nice tool that we can use to predict the outcomes of crosses. OK? So let's take the cystic fibrosis example, all right? If an individual has cystic fibrosis, you know that there is one gene. Let's call it the CF gene, the cystic fibrosis gene. And you know that that gene has two forms, a normal and a defective. Let's call it, it's got a normal and it's got the cystic fibrosis version. Okay? Now we call the different forms of a gene the alleles. Okay? 
So how many alleles does the cystic fibrosis gene have? Two. Look, Jessica, this is exactly how you spell it. I already got it there. So one gene, cystic fibrosis gene, and there are two alleles. Now, one allele is normal, and one allele is defective. Let's call it the CF gene, the CF allele. Okay. To have cystic fibrosis, you need two copies of the defective allele. So let's take parent one. What is their genotype with respect to cystic fibrosis? They've got two CF genes, right? OK. OK, so let's use, I'm going to just use the letter C, OK? The letter C. And I'm going to say that if you've got a normal copy of the cystic fibrosis gene, I'm going to denote it as a capital letter C. And if you've got the defective version, I'm going to denote it as the lowercase c. The defective one doesn't always get a lowercase c. All right? So parent one has cystic fibrosis. Let's use these letters. What genes do they have with respect to cystic fibrosis? They've got two of the little c alleles, right? So now let's take parent two. What do they have? They have cystic fibrosis. Right. Just, if somebody had a big C and a little c, what would they have with respect to cystic fibrosis? They'd be normal, OK? There's a good chance at least one person in the class is this genotype with respect to cystic fibrosis. You are? Okay. Stay away from Jessica. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So we're going to do this cross, right? And I've already told you that 100% of the offspring have cystic fibrosis. So these are the only alleles this parent can contribute. And these are the only alleles this parent can contribute with respect to cystic fibrosis. So the offspring have to get a defective allele, right? So let's see how it works in this Punnett square. There's my parent one. There's my parent two. Now, cast your mind back to gamete formation and meiosis, right? The chromosomes that the cystic fibrosis gene is on, you've got a pair of them. They separate during meiosis, don't they? Right? So what proportion of your gametes, or what proportion of this individual's gametes, is going to carry this particular allele, this one here? Half. And half are going to carry this one, right? So there's my little c, there's my little c. And let's just write in 50%, 50%. My parent two, little c, 50, little c, oh, 50. So all of the gametes of parent one are going to carry the recessive allele. All the, parent, all the gametes of parent two are going to carry the recessive allele. Okay. So if this gamete here, a gamete carrying this allele, fertilize a gamete carrying that allele, what's going to be the genotype of the offspring, the F1? All right, let's give you a little c, little c. And you can just fill in the table, right, to give you all the possibilities. So what is the chance that an individual will have these two alleles? Well, let's just think about just this box here. 50 times 50 is what? 50% times 50% is? Fifty percent times fifty percent. Fifty percent of fifty percent is twenty-five percent. Did you, Angelica? I didn't hear you, you gotta speak up. My hearing's getting Bit, bit on the dodgy side. You did? Yeah. Sorry. Tell Cameron to yell out your answers. Sorry, I didn't hear. All right, so if it's 25% this and 25% this and 25% this and 25% this, 
Well, these are all the same, aren't they? So 25 plus 25 plus 25 plus 25 gives you, so you're 100% of being in the F1s, OK? OK? Now let's look at a slightly different one. Let's just say that we've got a parent that has cystic fibrosis and they are going to have babies with another parent, which is normal with respect to cystic fibrosis. What genes could this normal phenotype parent carry? If it carries one normal and one recessive allele, it has a normal phenotype. If it carries two normal alleles, it has a normal phenotype. So there's actually two scenarios we need to run, isn't there? Yeah? All right. So let's do it for, which one should we do it for? A big one, a little one? All right. So now I want you to do it. So as soon as I see you stop writing, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to phrase it in very specific the way I phrase it, and I want you to think very carefully about your answer. It's not a trick question. And they won't be trick questions on the exam either. So you've done it. I just want you to tell me what is the probability of having an offspring, a child, an F1, that has cystic fibrosis. What is that probability? Was it? 50%? Anybody get anything different? So let's have a look. Parent 1, parent 2. So half these gametes carry the normal allele. And if that gamete gets together with that one, then that would be the genotype of this offspring. If that one happens to fertilize this one, if we have there, there. Filling in the box is just a mechanical process, right? Now, you're assuming that fertilization is, is kind of a random thing, right? That it's random which sperm fertilizes which egg, right? Given that 50% of the gametes carry this allele, then chances are you've got a 50% chance of these sperm fertilizes an egg, fertilizes an egg if it's random, right? So, 20, so this, 25% of these plus 25% of these equals 50%, 50 percent, okay? All right. So I want you to do the alternate <coughs> parent 2 has the same phenotype, they're normal, but they actually have that genotype. I'm going to be very careful the way I word this question. Okay? What proportion of the offspring will be this genotype. Do this cross and tell me what proportion of the offspring will be that genotype.
What you got? 100% them will be. OK. All right. Be very careful about whether you're asked for a phenotype or a genotype, whether it's a phenotypic ratio or a genotypic ratio. Explain the difference in this way. In this case, they're exactly the same thing. 